an that eternity. Would yes. Would you like a three-minute warning? Uh, yeah, at 12, give me a three. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll give you that over here. Yeah, okay, good. good. Give me a three. <laughs> All right. Remind me of your name. Bobby. Bobby. Yes. Bobby. Bobby. Bobby McPhee. <laughs> okay. I'm it's at about a, this level. It's not an Irish jet. Oh, yeah, it is. It's gone. Okay. <laughs> ben, it is so good to see you again and to welcome you back to Dallas. Thank you, Bob. It's been 20 years. Yes, since Paris, Texas. Time goes wow. fast, especially when you're making good movies like you always do. Thank you. <laughs> well, I did a few since Paris, Texas. Yeah. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. You just go from one project to the next, don't you? I'm a confessing workaholic. I like working. I like making one movie after another, but now this is the first time I promised my wife I'm going to take a break. And will you? We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> or will you be off writing? <laughs> I'll be off writing. And traveling. That's my main profession anyway. I like to travel. You never get me on a beach sitting down in the, in the, in the sun. I just, I'm not born for vacation. I like vacations, but I'm not one to sit around on the beach or sit around anywhere. Vacation, when I'm moving and doing things, that's fine. Vacation sitting, no. Not, not me either. I once made a vacation in Havana, and I shot Buena Vista Social Club on the vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and that couldn't have been a walk in the park either, could it? No, but it was all fun. That <laughs> Good picture, too. Well, let's talk about Don't Come Knocking, because that's the current project, and uh, coming out very soon. And um, I, I must tell you that one of the things I do uh, when I go to a movie, whether I'm reviewing or just going for fun, I always make a note, I even write it down, of the opening shot. Good. The opening shots of Don't Come Knocking are unrivaled by anything I've ever seen. They're beautiful. They're a knockout, so to speak, to stay with my title. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. It took, us, it took me months and months to convince the park authorities of Arches National Park to let me do those two shots. And I'm very proud of them because nobody ever shot that. And where is that park? It's in Utah. Is it near Moab? Near Moab, Arches. Both the double arch, this strange landscape that starts with these two eyes. You think it's like a Zorro because there's two eyes and then, real, and then it opens up and you see that it's actually two holes in the mountain and the mountain is looking at this little rider and that's our hero. And we think we're in a Western, but then we're not exactly. Just a Western locale for the opening of the film. I enjoyed it very, very much. But I, I understand that when uh, you and Sam Shepard were working on the script originally, that his character was going to be a banker. No, mine was the one that I suggested to him, but he hated the idea. He's a country boy. Sam is a cowboy. He didn't want anything to do with bankers and brokers and people from New York. He said, I can't write a script about these guys. But he liked a little grain of my initial idea. He liked the idea of a, an absent father and a son that he never met. So we, made, we then wrote the story together about the prodigal father, so to speak. I think that it's a movie that every family can identify with, even if it's a really solid knit family, because we all know families that are fragmented and uh, where relationships aren't everything that they could be. So uh, was that part of your consideration when you got the film? Absolutely. I looked at the little story I had in mind and I realized for this family story in the West, I just knew the perfect writer. I knew the best writer in the world for that material, and that was Sam. And that's, that's his stuff. He, all his plays and everything he does is about family, fathers and son, mothers and daughters. I mean, he knows that stuff really well, and I think he gave me a fantastic script. We wrote it together for over three years, and finally I uh, ended up casting his wife with Jessica Lang. So it is certainly a family story. Where did you find Gabriel Mann? 
Gabe, I saw him in a couple of little parts, and actually he came in for the very first casting session, and you never think you're going to find your actor in the first session. I mean, I casted in Los Angeles, New York, and London, and saw hundreds of young actors, and I always came back to the guy who walked in first, and he was fabulous. He actually could sing, because he's a country singer, and he had to sing a few songs, and he blew us away. He did great. I think he has a, another career coming. But uh, he was unknown prior to this. He was practically unknown. When I saw him first, he had a couple of film credits, but I hadn't seen this, these movies. And they were small parts. And he really took it and run. I mean, his very first day of shooting, our first day of shooting, I had to switch the schedule because the main set that we were going to start shooting in was unprepared. It was not finished. So I had to break him the news that on his first day, he had to shoot this most difficult scene with his mom. When the two of them confront each other and he wants to know, is that really my father? Did you, let's put it in other words, make love with this guy? And so that's a huge scene for a young actor with Jessica Lang. And he was so in awe of her. I hadn't even introduced the two of them together. And then I said, well, I hate, it, I hate to tell you, but you're going to do your most difficult scene first. And Gabriel went white and said, give me two hours. Jessica was cool. She said, give me one hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, they're beautiful scenes. And I was so thrilled to see Eva Marie Saint in this movie. But now she's playing an 80-year-old woman. And uh, I don't know what her age is, but she's not 80, I don't think. I have to break the news to you, she's past 80. Is she really? Otherwise I couldn't have cast her as Howard's mom. Howard is 60, so mom had to be 80 plus, and I can confirm that. We're not going to reveal how old she is, but she certainly doesn't look it and doesn't feel it. She's a great lady. I, on our first meeting, I mean, I, I met her in this fancy hotel in Los Angeles because these ladies don't come into your casting office. She came on her own, drove her Mercedes, drove it pretty fast. I was already impressed by her driving. Threw the key to the valet over 20 feet and he caught it in midair. I was impressed by the throw. And then as the car drove away, I saw the bumper sticker. It said, get off the phone or get off the road. And that was <laughs> my kind of girl. And I love that message. And I asked her, that's a great bumper sticker. Where can I get it? She said, Vim, I designed it and you can get it on my website. <laughs> <laughs> she was cast. What can you do? I mean, <laughs> she took me by storm. <laughs> get off the phone or get off the road. I love it. <laughs> That's mom right there. And you ain't seen nothing yet. After being Howard's mom, she was prepared to do anything, so she became Superman's mom. It's not a secret, but she's Martha Kent now, so you'll see lots of Eva Marie Saint. She's just great. Just still has that magic and that... Yeah. Great when, presence. When Sam and I talked about her as we were writing the script, we realized we both were madly in love with her when we were kids. Young men, of course, a little too young for that. Strictly from North by Northwest. She was so unbelievable in that movie. And so beautiful, too. And she still is. Yes. I don't know how she does it. You have a, a very well-known Texan associated with this film, T-Bone Burnett from Fort Worth, Texas. Doesn't he have a Texan name? <laughs> yes, T-Bone. <laughs> and T-Bone is one of the great singer, songwriter, composers of rock and roll period. He made some of the greatest soundtracks. Himself an accomplished singer and songwriter, although his own last album is 14 years ago, The Criminal Under My Own Hat, and that's my favorite album in the 90s. And he created one hell of a unique soundtrack for us, some sort of punk country sound which didn't exist before. <laughs> well, he's the man who can do it. <laughs> I, I want to speak with you just a moment about this year's Academy Awards because it seemed to be quite a triumph for indie pictures. And um, I just want to get your take on, you know, what that means to you as an independent filmmaker. Well, you see, I was an independent filmmaker because the term was coined, and I think some of my films, Paris, Texas, for instance, sort of have encouraged filmmakers in America to go that route. 
and before you knew it, independent filmmaking was a thing that lots of people were able to do. I thought it was amazing that this year none of the pictures that got any of the important Oscars were from the studio. It was truly amazing. It was a triumph of independent cinema. Although I have to say that my favorite movie last year was not even up for anything, except Cameron didn't win that. It should have won anything, everything by a landslide. And that was another Texan, Terrence Malick. At least he lives in Austin. He made the greatest movie for me in my book last year. That was The New World. And unfortunately, that went unnoticed. It, yeah, that is strange. It, it surprised me, too, that it was uh, all that but is, ignored. I mean, that is towering over everything. And in another 10 years, I think this year will be remembered for the year that the new world came out and wasn't noticed. Do you think it will have any effect on the big studios? Are they going to change their thinking? You see, the studios always think they have the formula. They know how to breed them. They know how to make successful movies. But in a way, it's sort of a relief that you see they don't really know. They don't know better than anybody else. So maybe they have to come up with a few more ideas and they have to become a little bit more inventive and that'll be a good thing I think because we've seen too many movies that are just remakes of other movies. It's either you know part two, part three, part four or uh, it's a remake of of some movie that uh, people still remember. Yeah so maybe you want to go see Don't Come Knocking the original. <laughs> <laughs> You've never done a sequel have you? Once in my life Wings of Desire I made something like a sequel, some sort of continuation got far away so close. I used the same characters, the same actress, then in Wings of Desire seven years later. But the reason was that the wall had come down in, Be in Berlin. It was a very different city. And I wanted, I just felt I needed the same cast in order to make that incredible change more visible. But. <clears throat> The film suffered from the burden of being some sort of a sequel, and that's the only one I ever did. I'm really not somebody who likes to repeat himself. Your name has always fascinated me, and I didn't know until just recently that Vim, W-I-M, is not your legal first name. No, my legal first name is Vim and Vigor. <laughs> No, I'm really, I'm really uh, Wilhelm, which is William in German, and so if I was American, I would be called Bill. And Vendors would be, turned, would be translated as Turner, so if I was American, I'd be Bill Turner. But luckily, I'm Wim Wenders. Actually, I'm pronouncing it now correctly. I've gotten used myself to saying Wim Wenders because I prefer to be spelled correctly. But... Um it, the, the name, the German authorities did not consider Wim no. a, a, a proper, I think the word was proper German name. No, my father was, went to, to the whatever you call that when you have a son and you have to get him um, registered. Registered, exactly. And he wanted to register me as Wim because we had a great uncle in the family on a Dutch side who was called Wim. So, and then they man was still old school, he said, no, Wim is not a German name. Find a German name for your son. We can't register him as Wim. So he picked Wilhelm because I was the closest. And my mother was horrified when she heard that I was christened. I had to be christened Wilhelm. She didn't want a Wilhelm. She wanted a Wim. And they never called me anything else. And even in school, if the teacher called me Wilhelm, I just didn't, I pretended I didn't notice. I wasn't Wilhelm. But the government can do that? They can regulate how a child is named? Not anymore. But I, you see, that was in August of 45, and I think the government was still sort of pretty authoritarian. Well, I'm glad that they've changed on that. In my passport, it still says Wilhelm. And whenever I write Vim, because my green card and my credit cards, everything is Vim. Mm -hmm. And my passport it still says Wilhelm, and every now and then I get to an officer when I, when I go into some other country and they erase Wilhelm and they write Vim because they want to be correct. And that makes you feel good. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> well, Vim, thank you again for coming. Congratulations um, on you. Don't Come Knocking. This is a wonderful motion picture. And the cast you have is just, uh, it's a dream cast, isn't it? It's a dream cast, and I hope it's going to bring me luck today <laughs> on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> no, each and everybody was just the best I could possibly get. And, of course, they had a good, good director to guide them through it all. Uh, that's what you said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Vim. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> that was very good. Cut. Excellent.